Dr. Vanuk, uh, thank you very much for uh, uh, telling us about this uh, really, really significant trial, at least in my view. Uh, you and a lot of uh, very important oncologists in the United States of America got funding uh, from the state, uh, which is the first good achievement because there's not so much funding around for clinical trials. And uh, you, uh, you uh, managed to do a comparative trial uh, which involved new agents from two different pharmaceutical companies. And that's another uh, big plus point. Um, tell me, first of all, about colorectal cancer in the United States. I'm from Europe, so what's it, what's it like here? Well, it's, uh, it's more of a problem than it, we think it should be. It's, of course, mostly preventable if people would be screened and if we could reach out and get colonoscopy or sigmoidoscopy in the po broad population. We do better than we used to. We still cure most more patients than we don't with colorectal cancer. But over 120,000 people will get colorectal cancer at one stage or another during a, in a given year. And while many are cured, there's still 40 or 50,000 patients a year who have metastatic colorectal cancer. And it's that last group that you were looking at with this trial. That's correct. This trial took patients who had, were diagnosed with advanced metastatic colorectal cancer uh, who uh, had not had chemotherapy or other treatment before that. Okay. And then uh, the issue of the KRAS uh, status was dealt with? Right. So this study is a, the study I will present that I'm presenting here, 80405, as we present it, will be only on the KRAS wild type patients. Right. The study init was initiated in 2004 when we didn't know about KRAS. Yep. So there was a, an earlier component of the trial. Those patients will, will not in total be discussed, it, it are not being included in this analysis. Right. So there's a thousand plus patients in the study, Correct. which is a fairly significant lot. But if you hear that there's 50,000 patients in the United States who might have been eligible for this sort of question, uh, that puts that into perspective. It's 2%, I suppose. And uh, you had a very clever design, I think, because you took account of the fact that there are two uh, popular chemotherapy cocktails, there's Folfox and Folfiri, okay? Uh, and then what did you do? Well, we knew that, uh, we believe that the complexity of randomizing patients to a, to a study uh, make it difficult enough to do a single randomization, and we yeah. felt that doing two randomizations would make it prohibitive. In the United States, for reasons that are, are, we, are, are more detailed than I can talk about now in this given time frame, Folfox is favored by many practitioners. And we believe that we had to go with the flow and give practitioners the option of using Folfox, although other practitioners might favor Folfiri. So we gave it, the physician and the patient would agree to which chemotherapy right. independent of this study. As they enrolled on the study, the decision was made, you will get Folfox or Folfiri, and then we moved on. Good. And that was a, 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 an institute decision? Correct. It was. It was generally. It was. A, it was out of our. We were. We were neutral on how they decided yep. to do that. Good. So that got. Uh, that took care of that, and that's a. That's a very important because that's the practical way it is. Yes. In in in, in the practice in, in oncology in the United States, and that's really important. And then the the question was what? Two well, antibodies. The, the question was two antibodies. When we designed the study, you had. Uh, the cetuximab, with this, which is an epidermal growth factor receptor inhibitor and antibody, uh, and you had bevacizumab, which inhibits antivascular endothelial growth factor, the, the angiogenesis inhibitor. Each was available in, in use in colorectal cancer, although cetuximab was not, in, was not approved for first line, bevacizumab was. Right. Uh, each of them works better with chemotherapy than without. And so the, the issue really was, is there a first-line treatment we should be doing? We're, it doesn't matter if you start with one, does, do you lose ground or do you gain ground, and are you better off? Mm -hmm. And that's a fundamental question. Where do you start? Sure. Now, patients, of course, want to know where we start and what we're going to do next uh, in the same visit. Uh, they, want, they ask that question as well, but the, this was asking, where do we start? So you had uncertainty about which antibody? Correct. And they have different toxicities, very sure. different toxicities. Uh, Bevis they're both really pretty safe, but bevacizumab causes mild hypertension, a, a few, a few uh, toxicities, uh, some nephrotic, some uh, protein in the urine, things that aren't usually game, game stoppers, but it turns out that cetuximab causes a severe skin rash, an acne rash that people just plain don't like. Yep. 
And so, so, the, so the issue is, is one better than the other, and at what cost would patients take one versus the other? And the answer? Well, the answer is thousand that plus patients. You must yeah, have an answer. Uh, we do. We have an answer in that. In fact, the patients do uh, in this study, as we defined KRAS wild type, the patients do the same. Okay. This, they, but what's noteworthy is that they live almost thirty months. Uh, uh, both are both groups of patients live almost thirty months, two and a half years. When we first designed the study, the average patient with this advanced disease lived twenty-two months. So that's a big shift. So the, it's a big shift, and we think it reflects sort of a different approach to patients. And critically, at least as w in this study, it didn't matter what order you did the treatments in. Okay. Now, this is important because it's in contrast to another study that is, it has been presented recently, and more data will come out at the meetings here, called FIRE-3, which is a mm -hmm. study from Germany which found that, that the antibody against EG, the epidermal growth factor receptor, cetuximab, appeared to be better than bevacizumab. That was with a different, every patient in that study had full theory. Okay. In our study, most had full FOX. And we think there may be some, down, some issues of subsequent therapies that may have changed the outcome. But our take home message is that patients really do have choices for, of how to be treated and that we, w we do much better than we used to do. Uh, most remarkably, I think, we have a, about 10 percent of the patients actually at one point or another are rendered free of disease in our studies. So wow. it, with, with surgery after chemotherapy. And in that group, a select group, the average patient lives almost six years. Yeah. And so what, you've, what we believe we can do is see that there's a subset of patients who do very well. The real message we hope will be in six months or a year we will be doing really comprehensive molecular analysis right. of all on these the, tumors all the on right. all the data, mm -hmm. and we will try to put a picture together to say how should we treat which patient and how do we get the best mm -hmm. result. But it's a very important clarification for the practitioner, and there are many in the United States who have to treat these 50,000 new patients uh, a year. And it's, correct. It's a big, big public health issue. Correct, and I think it also gives, gives patients some control yeah. because they can make a choice based on the sure. toxicities, what they're willing to put up with. Sure. So uh, I, we, th we think this is really a, a big step forward, yeah. uh, and we now will analyze it, and it may be that there'll be a subset of, um, of a subset that does very well, and wouldn't that be great, but w that, that is for another day. We'll, we'll have to wait for that. In the study, just a uh, detail, if I were in the study and I got an un un unbearable rash from the cetuximab, was I allowed to transfer over to the bifuzumab? You, the well, you, you could come off study. In yeah, fact, okay. in fact, about 20% uh, about, about of patients came off for that reason. And you could get in the my arm. Correct, and okay. you could get bevacizumab by your practitioner. It was commercially okay. available. Right. The study did not mandate any okay. second line, but because these are all available, there was it, there was a really common exchange uh, for most patients. And patients who had uh, hypertension from bevacizumab could stop a go-off study and get cetuximab. That's correct. Okay. Are you following those people? We are. Yeah. We are. And, and when do you reckon you'll get a glimpse of that? Because that would be quite interesting, looking at them right. in sequence. Right. So there are many patients who are still alive. Probably thirty percent. They're ten percent where we're still waiting to bring in new, uh, finalize the data. Okay. And so, uh, no, you know, distinguishing all of this will take time. The data was only released two months ago to me. Yeah. And so uh, we, I've had a group of incredibly dedicated associates, uh, statisticians, and data managers who've been crunching the numbers Good. pretty much endlessly, and, and as have I. So we're hoping in the next couple of months to, to get it all put together. And then as we do the molecular analyses, we're, we hope in a year maybe we'll act, or two years we'll actually be able to say these are patients who we should treat this way, these are patients we should treat that way. That would be a big difference. So the take-home message is clearly fall fox versus fall fury. That's not an issue. There's already a, a choice element there for doctor and patient Correct. alike. And cetuximab uh, with a set of, uh, of cutaneous uh, 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 toxicities, and bevacizumab with um, hypertension, some kidney problems. So these actually are, uh, in terms of uh, you reaching 30 months, are equivalent. It appears to be, yeah, yes. Is there a cost difference in terms of the, uh, the, the, the government who paid for this trial? Yeah, are they going to have to pay right. so more a, for one that, arm or the other? A that's a great question. So actually, insurers paid for the bevacizumab right. because that was part of the standard of care. The cost element, the drugs are about the same cost, uh, although the way cetuximab is administered in the study was weekly. And because of bevacizumab was administered every other week. 
So the cost of administering the drugs are different. So the cetuximab patients would cost a bit more uh, because of the frequency, because of the, of the, frequency of the injection. It, otherwise, it's it's almost a wash. Well, that's also a, an, an important result. Yes, absolutely. And we have a detailed pharmacoeconomics component that we'll be doing, but not. I won't be presenting that. Uh, congratulations to you, Dr. Vanuk, and to all your uh, your team of uh, of oncologists across the states. And I think a message to uh, uh, to the, the the funders of this important study is that it is feasible to do these large uh, population based trials and get answers, which will benefit uh, a, a large number of people. And this is what we we need to do these trials yes. because uh, if the pharmaceutical industry is doing it, they 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 will very much be particular about who they treat and how they treat. This res result is generalizable across broad populations, and this is what we need to do. We need sure. to clarify the standards. Good. Uh, I, I hope that the pharmaceutical companies watching uh, this video will take note and realize that there is indeed benefit uh, in, in doing this kind of study. I, I hope, I think they will. Thank you very much. Thanks indeed. so much. Thank you. I appreciate it. You're welcome. Thank you. Thanks for having me.